Today we come to give thanks. Today we come to lift our hands and to celebrate as God has led us into a brand new day, allowed for us to see another rising sun and given us the opportunity to do what God is calling us to do, loving God and loving our neighbors in the process. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord for God is good and God's mercy endures forever. Jesus, in the name of Jesus, we have a victory. Everybody say, in the name, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, Satan will have to flee. Oh, tell me, who can stand before us when we call on that great name, Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, we have the victory, victory, victory is mine, victory is mine, victory today is mine, I told Satan, get thee behind, Today is mine. I told Satan, get thee behind. Victory today is mine. Joy, joy is mine. Joy, joy, joy today is mine. I told Satan, get thee behind. Joy today is mine. Peace, peace is mine. Peace, peace is mine. Peace today. I told Satan, get thee. Peace. Love, love is mine. Love is mine. Today, love today is mine. I told Satan, get the love. Victory, 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 victory today. Behind, I told Satan, get me. I told Satan, I told Satan, I told Satan, I told Satan, get me behind, get me behind, get me behind, get me behind, cause victory. Victory today is mine. Hallelujah. 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 Ooh. Hallelujah. Victory is mine. Victory is mine. Victory today is mine. Satan, get thee behind. Victory today is mine. Joy is mine. Joy is mine. Joy today. Sing it from your heart. I told Satan, get thee behind. Joy today, love is mine, love is mine, love today, Thank you, Jesus. I told Satan,
esperan que vivirán. Love today is mine. Bless the name of the Lord. Beloved, today I am excited to share with you virtually a little bit of what we experienced in the sanctuary last week as we celebrated 112 years together as a fellowship. And we are thankful to God for each and every last moment of that time. And we are even thankful for the opportunity to march into 113 years together as a faith community. Now we can get started. Now we can push through. Our anniversary preacher today is the Reverend Dr. Harold Dean Trulier, who comes to us as a professor of applied theology at the Howard University School of Divinity. Dr. Trulier is a scholar, an activist, a thought leader in the space of supporting communities by healing them and allowing the returning citizens, those who have previously been incarcerated, to be able to live full and complete lives as they are allowed to come back in and to be restored as full members of community. Dr. Trulia will tell a little bit about his own story and some of the things that he has gone through being quite vulnerable in the worship space, but even more so, God is moving in this moment to allow us to hear how it is that we can be who Christ is calling us to be. Let us now worship together, and as we move toward that moment, let us Allow God to heal us internally and to give us that which we have been called into fellowship today to be given. Family, we are grateful for the opportunity to do ministry here on Reverend Tony E. Jackson's Senior Way. And we want to offer the opportunity for each and every one of us to continue in our worship through the giving of our gifts through making sure that the house has what it needs to be able to give to people who have a need, to be able to give to people who come through our doors, to be able to give to people who live surrounding our borders. Here now we have this chance to cooperate with God and to be obedient in the giving of our resources, those things that God has provided to us through God's goodness and grace, that unmerited favor that's made it possible for you to have resources at your disposal. You can give through Givela 5, which you access on your mobile device, or you can go to our website, BethlehemNewark.org, where you can go to the donate page and uh, find our mailing address where you can send a gift, or again, another link to Givelify to give in that vein. Or we invite you to come and be with us in worship in the sanctuary next Sunday at 11 a.m. as we gather to worship God. You are invited. If you've got love in your heart and a heart to worship God, through the uh, uh, ministry of presence here in the sanctuary and allow God to fall on you afresh here in our space. You are welcome and you might leave a gift with us here. Whichever way you choose to give, we will be ever so thankful and grateful for what God is doing in your life and through your life to bless somebody else. God bless you, beloved, and let us be faithful. Lord, our Father, there is no shadow of turning in Thee. Oh. Oh, 
songwriter put it like this just as the children of Israel trapped by the Red Sea by that mean old Pharaoh and his army they had the Red Sea all around them the army in the back, and guess what happened? Just like that, God showed up with a miracle. Just like that, I come to tell you he's on on time, God. Yes, yes, yes. There you go. Oh. Yes, he is. God bless you. So glad that he is a on time God. Yes, he is. Give honor to God, to Pastor Sullivan, Sister Sullivan, my friend, Gwendolyn Wiggins Walcott, Dr. Gwendolyn Wiggins Walcott. Your presence confirms this word because um, she's seen me at my worst. My, my fiance, Pastor Brenda, and my pastor, she has not seen me at my worst. She's just heard rumors of what I used to be like. Because unlike you, I was not born saved. Um, some of you shaking your head. Some of the rest of you weren't born saved either. You've been, been through some things. Uh, and um, yeah, what's not in my bio is 1000-2648. That was my inmate number uh, when I was incarcerated. And um, I don't have many numbers for the hospital bracelets that I wore from the emergency rooms, detoxes, drug and alcohol treatment centers, and psych wards that I've been in, somewhere around 32. And, and, but God. But God. And so I, I give honor to God because if it had not been for the Lord on my side, thank you for leading us in worship. I've been engaged for all of 26 hours. <laughs> So, um, Romans 5, Romans 5, verses 1 through 8. 
Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Sorry. And not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, and perseverance character, and character hope. Now hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out into our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. For when we were still without strength, in due time God, Christ died for our, the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die, but God demonstrates his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. May we pray. Lord, your will, nothing more, nothing less, nothing else in Jesus' name, amen. Moving from test to testimony. Moving from test to testimony. I love reading the Bible, but like most folk, I have favorite portions of the Bible that I like to read. I, I like the stories. I, I love the Old Testament, Reverend Sullivan, because it has so many stories, and I, I love the gospel because Jesus tells so many stories, and I'm a, I'm a story person. And, and because I'm a story person, and because I love to listen to you give your testimony, and because I like to share my testimony, I find the Apostle Paul boring. <laughs> Paul is boring. Reading Paul is like being in a seminary classroom, and I'm in them every day. They're boring. A lot of doctrine. A lot of teaching, and, and I want the stories. The stories soothe. They, 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 they inspire, but, but, but when I'm reading this doctrine, I, it, it, I've got to work. It's like being in school all over again. You, you very seldom hear people preaching sermons about Paul. Maybe Paul and Silas locked in jail, because that's a story. Or, or, or maybe Paul being shipwrecked, because... Uh, that's a story. Or, or, or maybe I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me because that, that's part of his story. But, but here in Romans, there, there's no story. I want a story. Maybe the story is that Paul is telling us that our testimony flows out of our test. That the only reason you have a story to tell is because you've been through something. Uh, it's, it's, it's church anniversary, so that, that's 112 years of stories. And, and, and none of us is that old, but, but you have years and years of stories. But the question is, does your story lead you to a testimony or, or, or is your story something that you repeat over and over and over and over again? So some folk have, have 20 years of experience. Other folk have one year of experience 20 times. I think it was Einstein who said the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. So, some folk get, 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 get married a second and third time, but it's the same person. <laughs> Somebody knows what I'm talking about. You, you keep picking the same person over and over again and wondering why your relationships don't work out. 
You, 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 you keep drinking over and over again and wondering why your problems aren't straightened out. That when you come to, you, you still have the same problems. In fact, they're worse now because you don't have the money you spent on the alcohol. There's a difference between an experience that is just one that you live through and an experience that you learn from. And so when Paul is writing to the Romans, what he's doing is he's saying, you all have tests. You all have trials. Life is hard. Have you figured that out by now that life is hard? I know you try to make it easy. I know you try to make it, make it smooth. And, 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 but, but even the songwriter said, must I be carried to the skies on flowery beds of ease while others fought to win the prize and sail through bloody seas? Have you figured out? that life is hard. Life is so hard that folks want to be congratulated for doing what they're supposed to do. It, 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 it seems like a miracle that I, I just do, well, well, I take care of my kids. You're supposed to take care of your kids. But so many folk don't take care of their kids that now we applaud somebody just for taking care of their kids. Life is hard. Life is so hard. Oh, I know I'm going to make somebody mad, but just stay with me for a second. That's all right. I get, I, I'm leaving afterwards, I promise. He, he, that's your pastor. I'm leaving. Life, education is so hard that we feel like we have to encourage our children so much that we put a cap and a gown on a five-year-old and say, you graduated kindergarten. You're supposed to graduate kindergarten. Well, he just needs some encouragement. <laughs> Putting a cap and a gown on a five-year-old. Yeah, I said it. <laughs> I was talking to the camera. I wasn't talking to anybody else. I just want to make sure the folk in the camera don't feel like they're just listening in. You know, that, that, that's, that's the new pan, pandemic pastor. My, my former pastor, Taft Heatley, wrote a book called the pandemic pastor, and he said that when we're preaching on the video, we have to make sure that we make contact with the folks watching so they don't feel like they're just overhearing the service. And so instead of saying, can I get an amen, he says, put that in the chat line. <laughs> Life is hard, and we try to make it easy. We, 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 we push off aging. We don't want to recognize that we're, we're getting older. I don't want to recognize I'm getting older, so now I'm, I'm debating, should I, should I, should I touch up the beard so I don't look so old? Especially since I'm marrying such a young-looking woman. I, I, I want to, I wanna, you know, I, I want to look young too, but, but what, what's really going on is I don't want to admit the fact that I'm getting older, that life is hard. We, we, we look at the wrinkles in our hands and try to cover up the wrinkles. No, no, the wrinkles are evidence that you have worked, that you've been about something. But this world tries to trick us into thinking that life is hard. Life is easy, rather. But the truth is that life is hard. And so Paul deals with the difficulties of life in Romans chapter 5 and the meaning of the difficulties of life in Romans chapter 5. And, 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 and what's happening is so many of us are asking, watch this, so many of us are asking to be exempted from the difficulties that we miss out on the benefits of the difficulties. Let, let me say that again. Somebody missed that. So many of us are trying to be exempted from the difficulties that we don't recognize the benefits of the difficulties. Paul says, you've been justified by faith. We, faith. we have peace with God. That's the starting point, that we have peace with God. Now, not the peace of God, but peace with God. There's a difference. Peace with God means that because we've given our lives to Christ, we're all right with God. It means we've overcome the division between God and humanity. It means that we have a relationship with God. He uses the word later, we have access to God. That's peace with God. But how many of you know that you can have peace with God, but not the peace of God? You can be in, have access to God, but not have God's peace. Because God's 
peace, the peace that passes all understanding, the, the peace that is poured out into our lives comes through experience. There's the story. Now I can relate to this as more than just doctrine. It has to do with my story. It means that I have to first understand that I have peace with God and then have to discover how to have peace of God. And Paul goes on to tell me this. He says, because I have access, because I've been justified by faith, then when trial comes, and it will come, verse 3, not only that, but we glory in tribulations. Oh, no, 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 no. I don't want to glory in tribulation. Can we be honest for a minute? Do you want to glory in tribulation? No, because I don't want any tribulation. I mean, that's what the TV preacher promised me, Pastor Sullivan. The TV preacher promised me that if I give my life to Jesus, I'll never get sick again. If I give my life to Jesus, I'll never be broke again. If I give my life to Jesus, I'll never have trouble again. If I give my life to Jesus, I'll get a promotion. I'll be able to move to the suburbs. If I give my life to Jesus, I'll get a Beamer. I'll get a, I'll get a Benz. I'll get something. If I give my life to Jesus, everything will be all right. That, that, that's what they told me. I, I even sent them $50. Because he told me, I don't have any trouble. All I need is faith in God. He told me if I got sick, it was because I didn't have enough faith, so I have to build up my faith. He didn't tell me that life is hard. And so I glory in tribulation, says Paul, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance. I hate perseverance. So, so, don't you hate perseverance? Because it's stressful. It means I gotta work. I don't wanna work. I want God to do all the work. Y'all look at me like, like, like I've just dropped off the planet Mars, but, 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 but you know what? We, we want God to do all the work. You know how I know that? Because we ask God, Lord, give me perseverance. Like he's gonna just, all right, persevere. The only way you can learn perseverance is to go through something. Some, some of you are still looking at me funny. Let me, let me help you out. You ever pray for patience? It's a dangerous prayer because when you pray for patience, it means that you got to go through something to prove that you got the patience. There's no way. God doesn't just, he's patient, hallelujah. It doesn't work that way. When you pray for patience, when you pray for perseverance, it's because life is hard and you're going through something. The question is, as I go through this thing, the question is, as I endure this thing, the question is, as I carry this burden, what am I going to learn about the character of God? Yes. See, we're talking about the things that folks will celebrate 50 years from now when they celebrate the anniversary of Bethlehem Baptist Church. Because they, 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 may, they may celebrate all of your outreach work. They may celebrate the, the ministries that you have. But the ministries and the outreach will, be not, will not occur if you don't develop the character that God wants you to develop. And part of that means he's got to take you through some stuff. Because there's no testimony without a test. I want God to get me out of trouble. But sometimes God leads you into trouble just to teach us something. I, you don't believe me? Look, Jesus got baptized in the river Jordan and the spirit of God descended on him as a dove. This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And now the spirit is upon him. And guess what happens? When the spirit comes upon him, he doesn't do the dance. When the spirit comes upon him, he doesn't speak in tongues. When the spirit comes upon him, he doesn't go heal the sick. When the spirit comes upon him, it leads him into the wilderness. I, I, that always struck me because I, I'm like, the Spirit of God is not supposed to lead me into the wilderness. The Spirit of God is supposed to make me happy. The Spirit of God is not supposed to lead me into the wilderness. It's supposed to lead me to the rock that is higher than I. The Spirit of God is not supposed to lead me into dangerous places. The Spirit of God is supposed to lead me out of the dangerous places. I can find the dangerous stuff on my own. Yeah. Well, sometimes God takes us into those places. Because there's something God wants to teach us to make us stronger. So, 
Y'all know that's, that, that little poster about the two sets of footprints? Everybody know that one? I, I, I love that, right? You know, two sets of footprints on the sand, and then when there's trouble, there's only one set of footprints on the sand, and then when the trouble's over, there's two sets of footprints on the sand. And, and, and the guy says, Lord, what are these footprints? And he says, they're my footprints and your footprints. And he said, but when trouble, there's only one set of footprints. And, the, and, and God says, that's because those were the times when I carried you. There's another one with two sets of footprints and this big space, broad space. And then two sets of footprints and this big, broad space in, in, in the sand. And the man says, well, God, what is that? He says, those are you and me walking together, those two sets of footprints. And he says, well, what, what about that big, broad space? He said, those were the times of trouble. And he said, well, God, why, where's the, why is it a big, broad space? And God says, because that's when I had to drag your butt. I'm not talking to anybody that's been dragged. <laughs> you ain't want to go. <laughs> you ain't want to deal with this. But God took, had to drag your butt through some stuff. And on the other side, you were stronger than you were when you went in. And so Paul says, the tribulations produce perseverance and perseverance character. One of the things about character that, that's powerful is character is attractive. You know anybody who preaches a good gospel, but you see no evidence in their life? And, and, and you're so turned off by their life, you don't want to hear anything they have to say? One of the things I love about going to recovery meetings is that one of our mottos is, it's attraction, not promotion. You walk into a 12-step meeting, and the question is very simple. Do you want what we have? Right? We got sober, you're not, do you want what we have? And if the answer is yes, you're willing to go along, you're willing to, to, to go to certain lengths in order to get what they have. Now here's the question for every church in America, not just Bethlehem, every church, but does the world want what you have? Do they see in your church the character that attracts folk? Or Am I so busy trying to come to church to get what I need that I don't want, I don't have time to worry about letting my light shine? I need someone to shine a light on my situation. So church is basically about me. It's not about living an attractive life. In fact, that's why a lot of churches, not y'all, not y'all, not y'all, not y'all, not y'all, not y'all. A lot of churches have these great service programs. They feed the hungry. They visit the prisoners. They clothe the naked. But nobody joins the church. Because they're grateful for what you give them, but they really don't like who you are. They can see, they see in you that you're just doing that to, be a fa to do them a favor. You're just trying to be helpful. You're trying to be a blessing. It's a form of what Reverend Eugene Rivers calls self-referential altruism. I bless you so I can feel good about me. I don't, I don't know if you're going to have me back, Pastor, but I, I just, I'm finding out how hard life is, and I'm looking at how many churches are struggling, and the world is hungry for the living bread. They're, they're, they're hungry for something different. They want to see something that makes sense to them that's different than what they see in the world. When Paul is preaching to the Romans, he's talking to Christians in the most powerful city, the most powerful empire in the world. And he's saying there's got to be something different about you. He's not trying to get them to be successful as Romans. The American church is... You know, we're going to help you be successful as an American. Trying to help you climb the, climb the ladder to success. When Paul says, what I'm trying to do is to get y'all to develop character. Because once you develop character, once, once you've been through some things, once you've understood the purpose of the test, he says, I'll give you a testimony. 
and your testimony will be hope for others. The reason I talk about my life as an alcoholic, and that's why I said she's seen me at my worst. She and a group of folk had to come down from New York City 30 years ago and, 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 and literally keep me alive as I went through withdrawal by myself is because I want somebody else who's struggling with alcohol to have hope and know they don't have to stay there. Which also means I can't drink anymore. Because my life has to be attractive enough for the person that's struggling with alcohol to say, I want what you have. The reason I talk about having been in prison because of my alcoholism, the reason I talk about having been locked up is because I want every prisoner to know that your sentence is not final. Amen. Amen. And if I'm talking to somebody today, you've got a son or a daughter who's in the criminal justice system. You may have a son at Northern or in Essex County Jail or a daughter who's out at Edna Mayan or, or somebody in the federal system. It's not final. Yes, yes. And you have to live in such a way, I know they hurt you, I know they let you down, but you've got to live in such a way that at some point when they come to their senses, have what we call a moment of clarity. They, they, like the prodigal son, they're able to say, my daddy, my mama, they, they, they don't live this way. My daddy, my mama, they don't struggle like this. My mama, my daddy, they, 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 they've got a safe place for me to come to. And I'm going to humble myself and come back and make things right. There's where the hope is. That, the, you, you, you give your testimony to give hope to someone else. To let them know that trouble don't last all the way. Trouble is real. We have to stop denying trouble is real. Trouble is real, but it doesn't last always. Jesus died that we can go to heaven. But what about between salvation and heaven? He didn't just die to get us into heaven. He died to set us free from the sin that easily besets us on earth. Yes. And so I, I, I've dedicated the rest of my life to helping people understand that what we have is more than fire insurance. You know, accept Christ, go to heaven. If it was just fire insurance, you'd have, you'd have dropped dead this moment you got saved. Right? I'll give you, I, I confess Jesus Christ is my Savior, and you drop dead because that's all it is. No, it's also the capacity to endure the fact that life is hard. And Jesus' death says that sin has no more dominion over you. Life is hard, but you can meet it. Life is hard, but you can deal with it. Life is hard, but the love of God has been shed abroad in your heart by the Holy Spirit and has given you the ability not only to deal with it, but to shine in the midst of it. So that other people look at you and say, how can she smile when everything's going wrong? How can he be happy with a son in jail? How can she be wonder feeling good with a parent that treats her like that? How can she praise God in spite of Amen. the world is looking for folk like that not folk to just come to fill up on Sunday and go back out there can I, can I help you out I'm going to finish with this story it's a story about heaven right we're all going to heaven but, but I don't know anybody who's homesick Heaven's my home, ain't homesick. So how do I learn to live here? Jesus said, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And so the hope that Paul talks about is about living hopeful on this earth. And I know we can do it. My, my mother helped me with this. Last story. My mother, my mother baked the best pound cake in West Philadelphia. She, she, and, and, and it was no mix. It was milk, 
butter, eggs, flour, sugar. From scratch, she made pound cake on Saturdays. And me and my brother, we would help her with the, the, the mixing of all the ingredients until it was ready to put in the oven. And we would mix all these ingredients, and we'd put them in the oven, and, and, and pour them into the, well, first pour them into the cake tin, right? And then you put them in the oven. And, and then we'd be sitting there waiting for um, the cake to be ready. We're sitting there looking in the, in the window. You, we had one of those ovens that had the, the, the button you mash, right? Did you have one of those? You mash the button and the light comes on and you're waiting for the cake to be ready and you're, you're salivating and you're imagining in your mind what that cake tastes like. And my mother would come into the room and she'd see us and she said, what's wrong with you boys? And we said, we're, we're, ready, we're, we're ready for the cake, Ma. We're, we're waiting for the cake. And she would say, well, sons, your, your, your cake is not ready yet. But I'll tell you what, while you're waiting for the cake, I'm going to let you lick the bowl. <laughs> oh, and licking the bowl. Oh, that, 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 was, that was some good stuff, right? Well, that, that's, that's what heaven is like. The cake of heaven is not ready yet. But while you're salivating, looking over yonder, while, while you're waiting for your deliverance, while you're living in the expectation of the cake of heaven, we've got a God who lets us lick the bowl. That's why the songwriter said, blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine, heir of salvation, purchase of God, born of his spirit, and born of lost in his blood. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. If you've been through something, you can praise him. If you've dealt with tribulation, you can praise him. If you've dealt with trial, you can praise him. No wonder our ancestors said, how did you feel? When you come out from the wilderness, where you lean in on the Lord. Somebody said, I looked at my hands, and my hands looked new. I looked at my feet, and they did too. You can come through the wilderness and turn your test into a testimony. Because you have peace with God on the way to the peace of God. Thank you, Father, that you brought Paul through some stuff. Thank you, Father, that you brought us through some stuff. We should not, help us not to be ashamed of our testimony. <coughs> help us to be willing to let others know what you brought us through. Help us to live the character that's attractive. We accept that life is hard, but you can turn the test into a testimony. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Family, we thank God for the word that was preached as we consider how we ourselves move from test to testimony. And it is quite evident in our own lives as we consider our lived experience, as we turn around and look behind us, as we look back over our life and think things over. We know that there have been testimonies that have developed from the tests that we have had to go through. And here in this moment, we are yet in the testimony making business here as we make appeal to you who might be going through some test and, and looking for one who can help to lead you out who might be going through some test and looking to, to spend more time with the Jesus that is knocking at the door of your heart and looking to come in that, that, that Jesus might sup with you. Here is an opportunity for all of us to seek to live the abundant life, to seek 
undergo our salvation, to seek our liberation in this age and the one to come, to be able to find the central logic of the faith and the purpose for being a Christian, for not just having our fire insurance, as Dr. Trulier has, has aptly described it, but for the purposes of loving and living and serving our sisters, our brothers, our fellows, our friends, our neighbors, those around us. This is how Jesus has described for us to be. And this is what it means to claim the Christian faith and to claim to be a Christian. Won't you join us? Won't you come along and join this movement? Join even this church, this body. We invite you, our doors are open here for you to become a member of a body of Jesus followers who want to live, love, serve, who want to love God with all that we are and all that we have and, and love our neighbors as ourselves. We want to follow Jesus carrying the cross and following the one who has shown us the way. Here is your opportunity. First, if you have never claimed Christ before, to come close to the one who called you into being and called you into community. And second, for those who may have already done that, but they want to find their way into how to live this Christian life. We're here. We're here to help you. We're here to love you. We're here to serve alongside you. We are here and we invite you. Whosoever will, let them come. We'll pray with you. We'll pray for you. We'll study with you. We'll learn with you. We'll fellowship with you. And one day, one glorious day, we look forward to being able to rise with you and live a new life. But until that day, let us get busy doing that which Christ has called us to do in this place, in this age, in this day, loving our God with all that we are and loving our neighbors as ourselves. Whosoever will, let them come. Family, we are grateful for this chance that we have had to come together again. And we make appeal to you for a couple of reasons. Number one, we are still receiving our anniversary offering. We invite you to make an anniversary gift of $112 to Bethlehem Baptist Church over and above your tithes and offerings as you have been directed to give. And we also invite you to come along with us this week as we return to, to our normal schedule, as we gather together Tuesday morning at 6 a.m. for prayer together, as we gather for Bible study on Wednesday at 7, and as we gather to pray on Thursday at 7 p.m. We're looking forward to seeing you on October 7th as we come to, uh, second, as we come together to be uh, in the house for our communion Sunday, let us break bread together. Let us take time to prepare ourselves so that when we come to the church, we don't eat and drink unworthily. And we're looking forward to seeing you on October 9th as we celebrate Women's Day. Our guest preacher for the day will be the Reverend Dr. Shakima North of the Concord Baptist Church of Christ in Brooklyn, New York. We are doing some new things in our 113th year. We're gathering, and we hope that you will join us as we move forth and do our very best to be and become all that God has created us to be and become in this place. But until we have the opportunity for us to gather one with another again, I pray you receive this benediction. And now unto the one who is able to keep us from falling and who presents us faultless before God's glory with exceeding joy. To the only 
wise God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, dominion, and power both now and evermore. And the people of God said, Amen. Go in peace, beloved. And may the peace of God go with you. Lord, my soul desires.